I'm your speaker for tonight, Henry. So um, my educational background, I actually uh, went to Gunn High School, a very competitive um, high school in the South Bay. And then after graduation from high school, I then went to UC San Diego uh, Roosevelt College as a biology major. So then after college, basically I started working as a tutor. So in terms of my ex uh, professional experiences, I've worked as a tutor for over a decade. In terms of tutoring and test prep, um, I cover a wide array of subjects, including AP Biology, AP Chemistry, AB and BC Calculus, AP Stats, Algebra 1, Geometry, Algebra 2, Pre-Calculus, Biology, and Chemistry. And in terms of test prep, I cover the SAT, the ACT Math and Science sections, SAT 2 Biology, SAT 2 Chemistry, and SAT Math 1 and Math 2, the subject test. Okay, so I've worked with many students in the South Bay and in the East Bay. Some of your children may actually be attending these um, high schools right now. Okay, so our first topic is basically going to be the importance of GPA. So the GPA is a major factor that colleges consider in terms of determining whether or not to accept a high school applicant as a student for their school. Now, in terms of the GPA, you have to consider the GPA in the context. That is, they will consider the background of the high school that the student is coming from. So different high schools will have, um, for example, different types of instructors in terms of their relative difficulty for the class. Now, normally, normally the SAT and the ACT will be used as a way to level the playing field because it's, uh, it is independent of what high school the students are actually attending. Now, of course, this year, because of the pandemic, it has made admissions a little bit more challenging because students have had great difficulty actually being able to take the SAT or the ACT. So this in turn makes it so that the GPA becomes much more important as a measure of a student's academic ability. In addition, colleges usually have what are known as regional specialists. That is, these are individuals that are admission officers that have very specialized regional knowledge. That is, they have a good understanding of the high schools in a specific region, and their input can be very influential in terms of determining an applicant's worthiness for admission to a college. Okay, now, of course, even though the GPA is important, it is just one of many factors that students need to keep in mind when applying to college. As the lead academic advisor and a tutor, the things that I focus on are basically more kind of um, detailed, small kind of picture idea. That is, I focus more on the student's academic GPA along with standardized testing. Now, my colleagues that are the consultants, their focus is more on the application essay, the extracurriculars, and other areas that are more big picture kind of view. Okay. Now, it, the, since the GPA is so important, it's crucial that students understand how to make sure that their GPA actually is going to be really good. Again, remember, we have to keep in mind the regional context. So a 4.0 at, for example, let's say Gunn is actually very competitive, but many students actually do get a 4.0 GPA at Gunn. Whereas at a different high school, the GPA requirements might not be as high because not, everybody, because not a large proportion of uh, students at the school actually get a 4.0 GPA. So how do we actually improve a student's GPA? So one thing that students can do is to actually take summer classes, especially if a student does well in those summer's classes, it basically improves their GPA by adding an additional class, which kind of changes where their GPA is actually going to be. However, we have to be careful with summer classes. Picking the right type of summer class will help the GPA. On the other hand, if a student picks a summer class that's very difficult, it can actually hurt their GPA and also feel like a waste of time. Now, on top of summer classes, students can also consider taking community college classes. Now, again, just like taking summer classes, uh, community college classes will tend to be a little bit more difficult compared to even high school classes. So again, it's going to be important that students pick college classes that they can do well in. The last aspect, which is not directly related to improving GPA, but is also a critical component of making sure a student's GPA stays strong, is uh, being very careful about what courses they actually decide to take. So a key consideration as a part of course selection is making sure to kind of balance the difficulty of the courses that they're taking versus the GPA demands. What do I mean by this? So for example, some students as even juniors or even seniors, um, that is their third or fourth year in high school, will tend to want to decide to take, for example, six or seven APs. Now, six or seven APs is quite a hefty course load. In terms of rigor, it's very, very challenging to do well. So if students are taking the most difficult classes, that can affect the GPA by making it very difficult for them to actually do well in those courses. So it's important that a student balances the difficulty of the courses they're taking along with uh, keeping that high GPA. Now, 
because of the current situation with the pandemic, currently students are primarily using online learning rather than meeting in person. Unfortunately, online learning does have a lot of challenges and these challenges range from technical issues. For example, sometimes at home, you might have a issue with the internet where for whatever reason, you cannot actually get online. And in fact, that's sometimes a problem when I'm actually working with students where like sometimes my internet is not going very well and that can be very challenging to overcome. In addition, students need to uh, end up having to manage multiple platforms. So what I mean by multiple platforms is uh, some school districts, for example, will use a very specific platform for all their instructors, whereas other school districts will leave it up to the individual instructor themselves to decide what platform to use. For example, um, some of these you may have already uh, heard of before, for example, Zoom, like the platform that we're using right now, uh, Google Hangouts, or even WebEx. For some students, um, they may have difficulty joining the class for whatever reason. Maybe Zoom is malfunctioning. Maybe Google Hangouts isn't quite working. Maybe it's just really difficult to actually get WebEx to actually function. And this makes it very frustrating for a student when you know all they're trying to do is go to class. So that is one set of platforms that they have to deal with. The second set of platform is what I would call course management software. So these are so, um, software that an instructor may use to help manage the materials for the class. For example, posting notes, posting YouTube videos, um, assigning homework, etc. Of course, sometimes these platforms are not necessarily the easiest to use. For example, students usually take six or seven classes, and so they have to keep track of all the different links that they need to utilize to actually attend class. Some examples of course management software include Canvas, School Loop, Google Classroom, and Schoology. On top of these uh, more technical issues in terms of challenges for online learning, students themselves will also have other issues that they need to resolve as well. Because they're not meeting their instructors in person, there's a couple of issues that arise from this. So first is the issue of time management. One issue is, is that the students are now forced to basically be more self-disciplined and have greater self-autonomy in terms of actually doing their schoolwork. So some students do not have very good time management skills, and it's something that they need to work on in order to actually thrive in such a difficult learning environment. In addition, many schools have actually reduced the amount of instructional time because of the online learning. For example, uh, quite a few schools I know have actually made it so that most of Wednesday is um, termed asynchronous learning. What that means is that there is no instructor supervision at all. Instead, the student themselves must spend the time to actually learn the material on their own. The amount of time that the instructors are actually teaching the students has been reduced. And normally under a non-pandemic situation, instructors spend somewhere in the neighborhood of about 230 minutes per class per week. On average right now, on, under the online learning system, students are usually in class for about 180 minutes per class per week. This reduced instructional time means that students are getting less um, lecture time, less feedback from their instructor when it comes to actually learning the material. On top of that, students themselves can have motivational issues. In part, this is a, because normally there is a distinction between home and school. What that means is usually when they're at home, it's time for them to relax, it's time for them to work on homework, and school is where they actually focus on actually learning the material. Because they are in an online learning environment, it's much easier for them to be distracted by non-academic non activities. So what do I mean by non-academic activities? So one thing that I've noticed amongst, for example, some of my students, they sometimes will have things like Discord in the background. Um, Discord, if you're not familiar with what it is, is um, a online kind of chatting software. And so students can actually be, for example, talking to their friends when they're supposed to be listening to lecture. On top of all that, some of the students that I work with are actually transitioning from, for example, middle school to high school. And these are what I'm calling transitional difficulties. So there is a major change in terms of expectations that students need to be able to carry out when they're transitioning from middle school to high school. In middle school, the requirements were not as steep. It is possible for students to not really pay attention and to not really focus as hard and still do well. This actually changes when students go to high school. Students are expected to be more motivated to self-learn. They're expected to be able to um, do more work on their own and less structure compared to middle school. That is, there's less hand-holding by the instructor. Many students that are coming from middle school to high school do not necessarily realize that there is such a big jump in expectations. And in fact, one of my students just found it very, very difficult where he was having a very difficult time adjusting from that, you know, he just graduated from eighth grade and it's like eighth grade was fairly easy for him. But once he transitioned to high school, he found high school much more difficult, because, especially on top of the online learning, where he didn't realize that 
I'm going to have to spend much more time on my own to learn the material and understand what's going on. Some of the students that we work with have just graduated from high school and they are moving on to college. But this transition too also poses challenges for students. For instance, since students are not able to be on the college campus and are generally learning from home, there is a loss of self-autonomy. What that means is that it's harder for the student to actually be able to regulate just themselves. Instead, because there's a greater parental involvement, that makes it so that a student may not necessarily build up their self-discipline skills and be able to manage things on their own. Part of the transition from high school to college is basically trying to figure out how to be an adult. So now we've talked about the difficulties of online learning. So what are some of the possible solutions for online learning? Um, the first part of this is gonna be more student oriented. And then I will actually discuss a little bit of things that parents can do to help their children do better in an online learning environment. So one thing that students need to consider is that an online class is still a class. That is, it should not be treated as, oh, it's, it's boring. It's not interesting. They should be treating it just like an in-person class have respect for themselves and also for their instructors. Because the class is online, that does not mean the student is free to slack off. In fact, some students have found to their detriment that slacking off makes it really, really hard to do well at the end of the semester. In fact, one of the students that I just met with earlier today has slacked off for most of the semester and now is in a lot of trouble simply because he hasn't kept up with the work. And so now it's very challenging for him to actually remember and understand the material that he needs to know for his finals. Because it's an online class, there's less, fewer reminders for students to remember to stay on top of all their assignments. And because of the fact that everything is submitted online, there's also less pressure to stay on top of assignments. Remember, because they're interacting with their instructors less due to reduced instructional time, and because they are not meeting in person, the students themselves have to have the self-discipline to actually turn in assignments. It's also important for students to learn to manage their time effectively. What that means is that the student needs to plan out when they will get different assignments done. It's very, very easy to forget in terms of actually figuring out when to actually get things done. The normal habit that some students have is to leave schoolwork to the very last minute. And that's actually very, very dangerous to do because it's very easy to actually forget to do assignments because you're not meeting the instructor in person. So it's important that students have an effective plan in terms of how to get their schoolwork done. So one strategy would be, for example, they can um, put everything into a Google Calendar. This way, they, this is, since they're usually at the computer, this serves as a very easy way to remember, okay, I actually have to get these assignments done. Oh, I need to actually attend class. And in fact, that is something that I've helped multiple students plan out, figuring out when they're gonna go to class, figure out where their links need to be for their classes, and you know when they are actually going to be meeting me. I strongly recommend that students basically have a, sp a specific space that they use for studying. By having that actually just a regular space that they spend um, studying, it makes it easier to kind of get into that zone, get into that mindset of actually studying. They need to remember to block off time accordingly for school and for homework. So what that means is that, for example, school generally is going to be anywhere from like eight to three, Monday through Friday. So that's something that they should basically have blocked off mentally, either mentally or on a calendar. Then they need to arrange time to actually work on homework. Considering that there is less instructional time, it's very important that students spend more time to practice, to review, to study for exams, for example. Students need to be ready and prepared to do significantly more self-study and self-learning in comparison to the past. Because there is, again, less instructional time, it's very important that students do spend the time themselves to actually learn and understand the material. I did mention the use of Google Calendar. So some students don't like using Google Calendar. They can actually use like, for example, a paper uh, back planner. That is, they just write out their schedule that way. In fact, one of my former students, that's literally what he did. He was homeschooled. And so basically his mom did not actually manage, every, manage his schedule at all. It was up to the student to basically manage everything. And when I saw how he had like this little book where he basically just wrote down everything for all of his classes, I was still kind of amazed that he actually had that level of self-discipline. We'll talk more about that uh, case a little bit later. Now, as parents, you might find, okay, my kids are doing online learning. How can I help them do better in school? How can I help them do better in an online learning environment? So one thing is, is help make sure that your kids actually have a dedicated space for classes, homework, and study. This does not mean letting your kids study from their bed. Some students like to study from the bed. I find sitting from the bed is not the way to go. It makes the student feel a little bit too comfortable, a little bit too at ease, and there's a lack of focus and concentration when they do so. So typically I recommend that students study at a desk, either at a desk or at like, for example, a kitchen table 
or even a living room table. Make it easy for your kids to get in that kind of mindset that I'm actually going to school. Now, some students do not have the self-discipline to come up with a schedule on their own. And so they do not have a really good daily routine. So it can be helpful if the parents help their kids figure that out. When do you need to go to school? When do you need to get homework done? When do you need to um, find time for your extracurriculars, et cetera? It's very important that parents actually talk to and listen to their children. Because sometimes a child may ask looking for help, but they might not explicitly say that they need help. So paying attention to um, the kids will actually help you as a parent uh, find ways to help your children um, resolve whatever difficulties that they have. It can also be helpful to actually have a, a set routine for yourselves as well. This way you can be a role model to your children um, by leading by example. Now, unfortunately, because we're all doing online learning, students are actually in front of a computer screen um, a significant portion of the day. Therefore, it's very easy to feel exhausted staring at a computer screen all the time. And in addition, because there is a transition away from the normal routine, their routine has been disrupted. In that case, students sometimes will feel a little bit lost, a little bit unsure of what they should be doing. So there are a couple mechanisms that we can use to help students feel more comfortable in terms of what they're doing. So one is a separation of activities in terms of space and in terms of time. So what do I mean by that? By spatial separation, I mean have them do things in different environments. So they can have their classes, for example, um, like basically at the kitchen table. They might actually do homework at a desk in their own room. And then they might socialize with their friends, um, in, for example, in the living room. So that would be a separation on the basis of space. They can also separate um, activities on the basis of time. So what I mean by that is like, for example, if they're in school from eight to three, they should probably take a break from actually being on the computer all the time. So maybe, you know, they uh, do non-computer related activities from like, say, three to five. By separating the sessions, they're meeting temporarily a little bit, that makes it so it's less likely that they will feel very exhausted um, being on Zoom all the time. It can be helpful for students to spend less time on the computer and the phone, if at all possible. So one strategy for that is to actually do their homework assignments on paper and then basically take a picture later on and then upload it to um, uh, the course management software as needed. Now, students generally like to claim we're very good at multitasking. It's not a problem they should actually avoid multitasking. The thing is that as people, we are not actually used to multitasking very well. And when we actually do try to multitask, what we're actually doing is actually disrupting our ability to do the different tasks at the same time. Because what we end up doing is we end up focusing on one activity for a short amount of time, and then we switch to another activity, and then we switch again. It leads to a disruption in terms of the focus, in terms of the focus that the student is utilizing on each activity, and the results may not be as good as it could, can, it could possibly be. Other ways to help deal with the Zoom fatigue. It's important that students utilize the break times effectively. Part of that is, is because they are in Zoom classes for a significant portion of the day, it's important that they look away from the webcam and, and the computer screen every now and then, even during class because this gives your eyes a bit of time to kind of rest and recover from staring at the screen all the time. Between classes, typically students have about maybe five to 10 minutes. It's important for them to get away from the computer during that time, stretch and basically relax their muscles a little bit so that they feel a little bit more comfortable. Sometimes students may need to get a snack or get some water. That way they will actually feel a little bit more energized when they are actually attending class. Now, another important strategy is when actually using Zoom or other um, web classes, it's important to reduce the amount of on-screen stimuli. Basically, when there's a lot of material on the screen, it's very easy for our eyes to get fatigued. And the reason for this is because our eyes are trying to absorb everything. So one thing that um, you can do is to have a very plain background like I have behind me. Right now, I just have a blank wall. This makes it so it's the only thing that you can really look at is basically just my face and there's nothing distracting in the background. So have a very plain, simple background, and that makes it less visual stimuli for your eyes, which means your eyes will get less fatigued. Instead of utilizing gallery view in the Zoom, which basically shows all the individuals that are participating in a meeting. So usually a class is about 30 students. So that's 30 different people doing 30 different things with 30 different backgrounds. That's a lot of visual stimuli for somebody to process all at once. Therefore, it's better to actually use speaker view because it helps reduce the amount of on-screen stimuli. Certain activities can be done using non-video call strategies. So instead of using a Zoom call, for example, to talk to their friends, it may be helpful to use non-video call strategies. So for example, maybe text or chat-based platforms. Okay, 
So for example, they could use Discord, they could use text message, WeChat, or other non-video based strategies. Or heck, they could also do a simple phone call and talk to their friends that way. That would also help reduce the amount of time that they're spending in front of a computer screen. Okay, so since I've worked with so many students, I would like to spend a little bit of time to actually talk about some of my former students and how I help them become better students. So one of my former students um, attended Almador Valley. So when I started working with the student, the student was in 10th grade, and the student came to me with um, multiple Fs, specifically in Algebra 2, Biology, and AP Computer Science. Of course, having such a bad grade to start is, is a challenge but I felt like I was up to the challenge. And so I worked with the student to actually help improve their grades across all three classes. And in the end, basically he passed all of his classes. He got a C in all three classes. Then the summer of 10th grade, I basically worked with him in chemistry and um, because he actually needed to make up that course. And so making up that course during the summer, he actually got an A in chemistry, which was very encouraging for him. And then in 11th grade, I started working with him in pre-calculus honors, physics, and AP stats. Um, right now, he's actually doing quite well in AP stats. He's finding AP stats to be quite simple, relatively simpler. But again, he's having some challenges in pre-calc honors and also physics. But again, he's still doing quite well overall. Okay, so what were some of the major issues with this student? So first off, the student had motivational issues. Basically, he didn't actually want to do the work. He found, he found sometimes he just found it like there were better, he felt like there were better things that he could do. In addition, he did not have a very strong work ethic. That is, he had a tendency to kind of slack off whenever, whenever he could. And lastly, he also had great difficulty managing his time. Well, how did I actually help him improve as a student? So first off, I spent time to actually listen and actually talk to him, get, try to understand where is he coming from? What motivates him? What's driving him to do these incorrect and poor kind of behaviors. In addition to that, I helped provide explanations and, dis and discussion of the different concepts that he was having difficulty with. Part of the issue for him was he was not fully understanding the material that his instructors were covering in class because for him, it, the material was a little bit more challenging. And lastly, I also spent time to actually talk to his dad and kept his dad in the loop so that his dad could understand the difficulties that his son was having and help them be able to communicate with one another about what their expectations were. So that's the first student that I've worked with. Now, a second student, which I actually mentioned earlier, is actually a student that was homeschooled. So I actually uh, started working with him when he was in 10th grade. So in 10th grade, he was actually, I was originally supposed to work with him for AP Biology, but he actually later on decided that he did not want to take AP Biology uh, for personal reasons. And so I ended up not meeting him for AP Biology, but then later ended up meeting him for AP Chem. So he was actually taking AP Chem through the John Hopkins CYT program. Of course, he's actually quite rigorous using um, a number of different textbooks along with a lot of practice. Now, because the student is actually homeschooled and because AP Chemistry is a lab science, it was required that he actually do um, actual AP Chemistry experiments at home. Although he found the lectures uh, useful from the course, he felt like he needed a little bit more of a boost. He needed a, a little bit more detail, a little bit more analysis. In addition, he also needed more practice problems. And so that's some of the stuff that I worked with him on. Part of it is that for him, like even though he was very smart and he understood the material well, sometimes he had very specific questions that he wanted answered and that he wanted to actually understand. The time that he had with the instructor in a larger class was not sufficient for him to feel comfortable. Because he was homeschooled, his mom did not understand science very much about AP chemistry and was not going to be able to provide the supervision that the student needed to actually successfully um, carry out the AP chemistry experiments without blowing something up. So I basically helped him do this. So how one is because I've actually, I've worked with the material and I'm familiar with the experimental setups. I helped him basically set up his experiments and watched him uh, carefully do the science experiments that he needed to do. In addition, I gave him many very clear explanations of the different concepts that he was having some difficulty with, made it so that he could understand the material better. In addition, I also provided him with many practice problems. So he was also going to take the AP Chem exam and um, the AP Chem exam is three hours long, pretty quite challenging. And by giving him those practice problems, he actually did really well and actually got a five for AP Chemistry. 
Um, I think the last time I checked, he's currently at the University of Michigan, Ann Harbor. Okay. And now the last student that I'm going to talk about is a student that goes to a school in the South Bay, um, Leland High. So I first started working with this student when the student was in 10th grade. So in 10th grade, she actually uh, wanted to take the ACT. And so ultimately she ended up with a 35 on the ACT. She also worked with me on the SAT Math 2 exam. So we were actually gunning for an 800, but unfortunately she felt a little bit flat, but that's okay. 780 is also a very strong score for the SAT Math 2. Then the following year in 11th grade, I worked with the student in AB Calculus, AP Biology, and also SAT2 Biology. So five on the Calc, five on the AP Bio. For those of you that are not aware, the AP exam is actually scored out of five, where five is the highest score and then one is the lowest score. And fives are usually worth, at most colleges, some college credit. And we also got the 800 for the SAT2 Bio. So very strong subject test scores, uh, good AP scores, and also a very solid ACT score. What were some of the issues that this student had? So one is the student, although fairly strong academically, was a bit lacking in terms of direction and focus. In addition, some of her instructors were not that good at actually explaining the material to her. And so she wanted additional help for that. Now, uh, for this student, she was basically attending um, more of a large class kind of um, structure. Um, so I was teaching these larger classes, which had up to 10 students in them. And that's for all of the um, subjects that I covered with her. So not one-on-one -on -one tutoring. In those large classes, I provided a lot of practice for the students, and in addition, also lectured through the material. And well, for AP Bio, that was a lot of material. It, for, for some of the students in that class, they were a little bit surprised in terms of how I was actually lecturing. Like, I think I remember one class where they actually had a bunch of review questions that they wanted me to go through with them. And I'm like, sure, okay, let's go through it. And so they gave me the review questions, and then I basically started just talking about the concepts that each of the review questions covered. And the students were surprised because I was very thorough, very complete. And also they felt like they felt like I was reading out of a textbook practically. And then when I actually twisted my computer around and showed them the screen, they were like, oh my God, you're only just looking at the review, review questions and just basically answering the questions completely from memory. You're not referring to anything at all. And they were kind of like, how can you do this, man? How can you be able to you know, know the material that well where you don't really have to reference anything and you can talk about it? In addition, this student, because of the um, lack of direction and focus, she also needed a bit of mentorship, a bit of support in terms of kind of understanding where, what she wanted to do, how to actually accomplish what she wanted to accomplish. And that support made it so that she felt more comfortable with herself and allowed her to actually thrive academically as seen with the um, different test scores. Okay, now I know the December holiday is coming up soon. Um, so before the December holidays, unfortunately, your children may be, uh, will be probably likely taking finals. So um, the major time period for finals is December 14th through December 18th, literally just the week before Christmas. Although um, some of my students are already having their finals for some of their classes during the so-called dead week, the week where there's not supposed to be any instruction, but some instructors like to give their finals early and go from there. So if your child is prepping for finals and is a little bit concerned about how they might do on their finals, it may be helpful for them to get some tutoring. So I cover math and science subjects. And then my, um, I do have colleagues that will cover history and also English. So the purpose of tutoring is to help students review, provide students with practice materials, and also explain and clarify concepts that they're having difficulty with. Okay, um, let's see. Okay, right. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about is a little bit about the SAT and the ACT. So are these two tests still important to consider? Well, although this year is a bit unusual because many schools have either gone test optional or test blind. So test optional is, uh, means that the school will consider the test score if you have it, but it is not a problem if you don't. And then some schools have gone test blind, which means that they will not consider the SAT or the ACT at all for this admission cycle. Now, the thing is, is that it's still important for schools that are considering the test. So it's important that students spend some time to actually prepare for these exams. So the spring test, I believe, will start in, uh, I think, March. So uh, it is important that students spend some of the holiday time. Yes, I know students don't want to do anything during the holidays except have fun and relax. But it is important that they actually do spend some time to prepare. Typically, if, especially if students are aiming for the top scores on the SAT, ACT, it's important that they spend winter break to prep 
And then that way it's easier when the, when it comes time to actually take the exam. Okay, so which test should students consider? This is gonna depend a little bit on the student. It's gonna cover it a little bit differently depending on the English versus the math section. So my forte is on the math side, whereas one of my colleagues will actually deal with the English side. So for the English portion, right, it's um, geared towards students that are deep thinkers. That is, they like to think deeply about things. They have a very fairly large um, vocabulary, very good reasoning skills, and are strong writers. Now, the math on the SAT is actually a little bit simpler compared to the ACT. It goes up through roughly algebra two and is a lot more straightforward in terms of what they want you to do on the questions. Um, the time pressure is a little bit less on the SAT, but uh, at least for the math, well, at least for the math section, the English section is kind of the time pressure is a little bit tight. In contrast, the ACT is geared more towards students that are very quick readers and very fast thinkers. In addition, these are students are generally much more attentive to the little details that make up much of the questions. Now the ACT, unlike the SAT, actually goes up through a little bit of pre-calculus, basically up through about law of science, law of cosines, so late trigonometry. The ACT actually has a section that is not on the SAT. The ACT has the um, ACT science section, which I call, I call it the cousin to ACT reading because it's very similar, uh, similar to the ACT reading in terms of an, um, analysis but it's in a science context. So some students, they do get really freaked out when they have to, when they see the word science and they're like, I'm not good at science. I'm not gonna do well in the ACT science. And then I tell them it's a cousin to the ACT reading. So the strategies are very similar, but again, there is a distinct science flavor to it. Now the time pressure on the ACT is a little bit higher compared to the SAT. So it is really important that students are actually fast at thinking. Okay, so now we can open it up to question and answer. All right. Thank you, Harry, for sharing. Okay. First question. What are the strategies to study for SAT, Harry? Okay. Uh, for the SAT and the ACT, since these are both exams that you can actually prep for. So uh, one of the things that I strongly recommend to students is actually working through practice exams. This basically gives a realistic feel of what the exam is going to be like. And also to basically very thoroughly examine the mistakes that they are making to understand, okay, why am I getting this question wrong? Uh, because it's not just about getting the questions right, it's also about understanding the process of getting the questions right. So that when you actually take the exam, you actually have the ability to think through what's going on. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. How to choose SAT or ACT is a better fit? Um, for many students, I find it's actually easiest for them to actually do a diagnostic test of both exams and then have somebody analyze how the student is doing on both exams to decide which one they should take. Now, um, th some students end up doing much better on one exam than the other. So it's a kind of no brainer at that point. They pick the, whichever exam that they are doing better on. But I know that for some students, they are kind of like about the same on both. And so then part of that is gonna be a discussion with the student to figure out which exam are they more comfortable with if their scores are fairly similar. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. The next question. I'm super worried about my a child choosing classes this screen, especially if he would take calculus A, B or calculus B, C, what should we consider? Okay, so first actually let's briefly go over what is the actual difference between the two classes before we actually talk about how to pick those classes. So calculus A, B basically covers um, derivatives and integration, whereas calculus B, C actually covers um, derivatives, integration, and also some miscellaneous topics. Typically for the BC course, first semester covers basically calculus AB at a um, much faster pace. And then the C part is covered in second semester. So one of the things that I would actually consider is looking, look at the students' math grades for the previous couple of years. So this would include their um, generally students who are considering uh, BC will have taken pre-calculus honors and have done well in that course because you need to have very strong algebra skills to actually do well in the BC Cal course. Okay, next question. Um... What do you suggest for students who want to improve their performance on their free response uh, aspect of AP Bio? Okay, AP Biology is a very conceptual course. So it is very important that students are well grounded in the concepts needed for the class. In addition, to do better on the free response, generally students need to run through practice questions. So the free response questions on the AP Bio exam are generally more difficult than the multiple choice. I kind of joke a little bit about like the um, AP bio questions are kind of similar to ACT science questions. So usually students don't have as much difficulty, 
But the free response can be challenging because they need to cover very specific concepts to, make, to earn the points that they need for those questions. College Board's website actually has a lot of free response questions that students can work through. And it's important for students to actually grade themselves harshly rather than leniently, because sometimes it's the little details that matter. Okay, next question. If the student took SAT more than once, is it okay to delete one of SAT scores? That's actually a very specific question. It is possible to delete ACT scores, but it is something it is something that is a little bit complicated to execute. You actually will need to send a letter to the ACT organization and request that they actually delete one of the ACT scores. Um, generally speaking, most students, if they've taken it up to three times, there's not going to be much of a change, you know, after the third time, if, especially if they've already done a good job preparing for the exam. So usually this is not an issue that uh, comes up for a lot of students. Most students should not need to actually be deleting ACT scores. After all, if they prep well, they should be able to do well on the exam. Okay, next question. Um, which one do college admission officers look at more, the weighted GPA or uh, unweighted GPA? When filing out your application, do you need to fill out both? And is a B in an AP class really better than an A in a normal class? As oh, this is actually a very good question. This is actually a question that's better served um, actually talking to one of our consultants, but college admission officers will actually consider both because the weighted GPA is a measure of course rigor. When you fill out your application, depending on the system, I think UCs usually they will actually calculate their own weighted GPA. So you will basically provide your information about your classes and the grades that you earned. But like I said, this question is actually better served asking one of our consultants rather than, rather than, than me as an instructor. Um, although let's see, the second half it says, is a B in an AP class really better than an A in a normal class as I've heard people say? So again, we, we cannot just consider the class in a vacuum because it's gonna affect the GPA. I mean, a lot of people do say a B in an AP class is better than an A in a normal class, but I rather just push students to try and get an A in the AP class because that will help their weighted GPA and won't hurt their unweighted GPA. Right, right. Actually, when the students are taking AP classes, your goal should be getting A. Otherwise, you know, you, you should consider getting some extra help because if you decided to take AP classes, you wanna show the college that you are capable to handle college level course. But if you get a B in the AP class, but of course you are, you are showing your disadvantage in that class. So try to avoid getting a B in that class. In addition, if, if the concern is you're gonna get a B in an AP class, I would suggest that students, I would recommend that they consider taking the normal class instead of taking the AP class, simply because it's not gonna hurt their GPA. Right. But that, this is um, part of something that we actually did discuss in the webinar itself the balance of, in terms of course selection, the balance between basically course rigor and GPA. So that you can, again, you cannot consider just the AP class in a vacuum because it's also gonna be affected by what other classes is the student taking. Right, yeah, so course selection is a big part of the uh, high school planning actually. So, okay, next question. If student take AP bio this year, is it okay to take SAT bio test in June? Uh, the answer to that is definitely yes. Although depending on the rigor of the student's biology course, like the, the high school biology course, they can consider actually taking it in June of their um, possibly freshman or sophomore year if they are take, if they're taking biology that year. Okay. Oh, um, Henry, can you tell a little bit more about SAT biology? Like what, what does it cover? What does it test on in SAT biology? AP biology or just regular biology or honor biology? Okay, so AP Bio is more, it's more geared towards critical thinking, uh, critical thinking and analysis, whereas SAT2 Bio is more fact oriented. So that's like the key difference between them. So if you're good with understanding the concepts, then SAT2 Bio should be relatively easier. AP Bio's challenge comes from the fact that students do have to think about application of the things that they have learned. Um, so it's important for students to actually work through practice exams, work through practice questions, so they actually understand what the format of the test is going to be like and what, what kind of questions they might expect to see. Okay, all right, next question. Do AP tests weight the same as SAT and ACT for college admission? I would say 
GPA and the SAT ACT would be a little bit higher than the AP test. So the AP test serves um, a couple of different functions. If you're taking AP courses, that will affect the GPA. So the test and the course are slightly different things. So like you can actually not take the course and well, and then take an AP exam if you self-study. But the weights would be actually be lower. That is the AP courses would have higher weight compared to the AP test. And then, yeah, the AP test, they serve a couple of functions. One is to basically, you can actually potentially get college credit if you do well on it. Typically it requires at least a three. Although usually I recommend students aim for at least four or five on their AP exams to maximize the chance that they will actually get college credit. And uh, what is the better time to take SAT math two after taking pre-calculus uh, pre or after calculus? Um, okay, so this one is also a good question. Um, I've actually seen students do a mix. So some students actually do it as early as actually finishing algebra two, but that does require their course to be quite rigorous. But if we're just talking specifically about pre-calculus, uh, post pre-calculus or post-calculus, I usually recommend students taking it um, after they finish taking pre-calculus, but before they've taken calculus. And that's because calculus is not tested on SAT math two. And so therefore it reduces the amount of conflicting information that they have in their, in their mind when they're actually taking the test. Okay, All right, next question. AP bio test or SAT bio test, which one is easier? Mm. They're testing different skills. So it's going to be a matter of the student and their uh, preparation. Like I said, like AP bio is more geared towards critical thinking and analysis, whereas SAT2 bio is more about the facts. Okay, All right, next question. How good is 770 in SAT2 math? And should I retake it to target for 800? Okay, so this is a common dilemma that students face, that I've seen quite a few students face. So part of it is, is how much time does the student actually have? Because they only have so much time. And so they may need to consider, okay, if can they actually do better? Can they actually get the 800? Well, like if, they're, if they have a lot of time, they can consider retaking to aim for the 800. If they don't have as much time, they will need to consider, is it worth sacrificing something else to actually spend time to study and do better on the SAT map too? Mm -hmm. And also when, when you are comparing, if the score is strong enough, you should also consider um, you know, your college applications. Who are you competing with and what ranking of colleges you're targeting? So you're, if you're tar targeting top colleges and all your competitors are getting 800 on the SAT twos, then of course your 770 is not strong enough. So you should have, um, you know, uh, when you compare with, to them, you need to think about the factors. Okay, next question. What grade should students start to practice and take SAT or AC? Um, it really, okay. So usually the math, um, which I briefly did discuss is, for SAT, ACT, like SAT only goes up through about algebra two for the math section. ACT goes up through um, early pre-calculus. So from the math side, basically whenever the students have actually completed those uh, math courses at school, typically the English section is usually the more problematic section. So usually those sections require significantly more work. So I think the earliest that I've had students actually take it is as early as ninth grade, like ninth grade, um, let's see, ninth grade, like in June. This is the earliest I've actually had students take it. But you can take it anytime up through, I believe, December of your senior year. Okay. Obviously, early, I try to recommend students not, try to get it done before junior year. So that way, the junior year is not basically a boiling pot of pressure because it's like you got your AP exams, you got your finals, your school finals, you've got like, you know, SAT, ACT. So it ends up being a lot, especially if you cram everything into spring semester, it really hurts. Okay, next question. My daughter's English is not very strong yet. So she is saying it is difficult for her to do word problems in algebra. She is in middle school. What can we do? Uh, main thing is definitely going to be practice. Maybe get some one-on-one -on -one tutoring. Maybe, um, let's see. So definitely word problems is something that a lot of students have difficulty with even in the, even in the higher grades. So practice is definitely going to be key to actually getting better at it. Also understanding um, which words are actually associated with which mathematical operations is going to be key to actually strengthening her ability to actually do algebra. Mm -hmm. 
All right, I, I think that's all the questions for today. Um, thank you, Henry, for sharing. If you have any further questions about college plannings or any other services that we provide, you can always contact me. And also our uh, weekly webinars will be posted on our WeChat group. If you are interested to join our WeChat group, you can scan the WeChat code on the screen on the right side. And um, if you cannot do it, you can add me on WeChat. I can add you to the group. All right, thank you so much, Harry, and thank you everybody for joining us. We'll see you next Saturday at 8 p.m. Thank you, okay, bye. Bye, Harry. Bye.